You know, I, I told you when the uh, week started, if, if you weren't here the uh, first night, that uh, when I was assigned the topic of glorification, when we talked about what glorification is, that glorification is not when you die, it's at the end of time when you and all creation will be restored and renewed, and I know some of you find this idea very compelling and beautiful, um, and I know I do when I read writers like N.T. Wright and C.S. Lewis talk about it. It seems so beautiful when they talk about it. But I notice through the years, when I talk about heaven, that people's eyes just glaze over. And I've always wondered why that is, to, more than my deficits as a teacher. Why, why do people's eyes just seem to glaze over when we talk about glorification? And I, I think there are a few reasons. One is it's, it's, it's by definition removed from our present experience. And most of us are so glued to our present experience, it's hard to think about something uh, far out and far up. Another reason is that thinking about heaven requires us to engage our imaginations. It's one of the great ironies of our image-driven culture that our imaginations have become atrophied. I agree with uh, Walter Brueggemann, the Bible scholar, who said the key pathology of our time is that we are too numbed, satiated, and co-opted to do serious imaginative work. But maybe the main reason we don't think about glorification is profound suffering is not, for most of us, part of our daily diet. See, when death was always in your face, when existence was harder, people thought about heaven more. Heaven had to be true. It was something that you wanted to think of every day. But perhaps we are too comfortable. It makes it hard to talk about glorification. Maybe more accessible for us, we've said this week, is to talk about the root of that word, and that is glory. And I know that's something we're all interested in, glory. So the first night we talked about the hunt for glory, ambition, what is your ambition in life? And then uh, night two, we talked about your glorious destiny. You know, where is your life headed? What is your true north? And that is for the image of God to be restored in you. When we see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. That was night two. And then last night... I tried to introduce you to your new BFF, that if you want glory as God defines it, God says, here is the way. Pursue humility. But tonight, you might be asking, what should I be doing now? What should I be doing today? It's one thing to see the horizon, but sooner or later you have to begin your journey. So what should you be doing today? Well, our text this evening is from 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 13 through 16. It's God's word for us tonight. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's glorification. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, what should you be doing today? You should be pursuing holiness. And all God's people said, but to say yuck. All God's people said yuck. You know, when you hear this call to pursue holiness. Let me illustrate this way. You guys are too nice. I do not like broccoli, even though I live in Los Angeles where you're supposed to like broccoli. I still associate it with my mom saying, eat your broccoli. It's good for you. That is, I associate holiness with something I don't like. Unpleasant but good for you. Grit your teeth and take it. And I'd like to submit that holiness is like broccoli for most of us. 
We may know we're supposed to want it, but many of us don't, not really. And perhaps for some of us, we think the good news is that we no longer need to want it. Let's be honest, both inside and outside the church, holiness is perceived as being stifling, off-putting, boring. I remember years ago as a young pastor, I was trying to encourage a young married couple that was going through a difficult time, and I quoted the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 12, verse 10. He disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. And I'll never forget their response. It was so wonderfully honest. They said, holiness? Who wants that? How wonderfully honest. Exactly, who wants that? Well, God wants that for you. In the Bible, holiness is not an optional extra reserved for the super saints. It is God's expectation for His people at all times and all places. When the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, He made clear the purpose underlying their redemption. This is Exodus 19, verse 4. You yourselves have seen how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice, you shall be my treasured possession, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God commands in the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, 44, Be holy, for I am holy. And we've just seen this command is repeated verbatim in the New Testament. What does it mean to be holy? To be holy means to be set apart completely for God's purposes. Which is why sometimes in the Old Testament, inanimate objects are referred to as holy. Bells and pots. Not because these bells or pots were morally spotless, but because they were wholly consecrated to God's use. That's holy. Holy means set apart for God. When used in reference to human beings, holiness means to reflect God's character in all of our ways, to reflect God's kindness, His compassion, His goodness, His concern for justice and the poor. And far from being optional, holiness is expected and even necessary for our salvation. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 14, it's a very important verse, says, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, this is not talking about the holiness of Christ outside of us, being credited to us by faith alone, which Hebrews also talks about. It's talking about, in this context, our personal holiness. And Hebrews warns, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. To be clear, we are saved by faith in Christ alone, but Martin Luther put the matter succinctly when he said, we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. So, to that most common, ubiquitous question, God, what is your will for me? You've asked that question. God, just tell me your will for me. What is your will for me? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4.3 answers that question once for all. This is God's will that you become holy. Not only is it God's will for you, holiness is said to be the great end underlying everything God has done for you in Christ. Listen to Ephesians 1 verse 4. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. This is a staggering statement, but if you are a follower of Christ, this is why God has saved you. He has saved you for a purpose. If you want to know, what, God, what, what is your purpose in my life? What do you have for me? He has saved you for a purpose to live a holy life. So the writer J.I. Packer concluded, holiness is the great end and goal of our redemption. God wants you to pursue this like, a, like an athlete in a race. Run in such a way as to get the prize, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9, 24. And yet, it's glaringly obvious, isn't it, that we don't, and by we, I'm, of course I'm including myself, and I'm, I'm talking about the Western church, it's glaringly obvious that we do not pursue holiness. That's not what we're conspicuously known for. And why is that? Well, here are three quick reasons. First, holiness is undesirable. Even the word has become tarnished, suggesting something negative, restrictive, prudish, life-denying, uncool. 
Holiness is uncool. When I was a little kid, my sister and I used to watch Little House on the Prairie. And the, the, some of you don't know what that is, but the character we loved to hate was Mrs. Olson. You know, arrogant, exacting, fastidious, legalistic Mrs. Olson. Now that's the image I had growing up of what holiness looked like. So that the call to be holy was fixed in my imagination as the big no to something pleasurable or fun. And still today, it may retain the sense of being set apart, but not in a good way. See, it retains the sense of being set apart, but not in a good way. A second reason we may not prize holiness is holiness is sometimes seen as unnecessary. Perhaps that's another reason it's not prized among us, is that we may think the gospel means that we no longer need to pursue holiness. So holiness, isn't that what Jesus died to give us? In a recent interview, the actress Kira Knightley said, If only I wasn't an atheist. I hate to disappoint you, yes, Kira Knightley is an atheist. She said, If only I wasn't an atheist. She said, I could get away with anything. You just ask for forgiveness, and then you'd be forgiven. But that's how the gospel is sometimes misrepresented, which might explain why there are so many who claim to believe in God, but so few who love godliness. And a final reason we may not prize holiness today is that it seems unattainable. It's just too hard. It's too demanding. We cannot see ourselves being able to attain it. To see it as our horizon is only a recipe for inevitable failure. It's easy to become cynical about it, to say, well, that's impossible, or, or resigned. If it is possible, it's not possible for me. A close friend in L.A. put it to me memorably a few years back. He says, I see where I am. And I see the distance, way in the distance where I'm supposed to be. And the distance between those two seems impossibly long, so why even try? Why should you even pursue holiness? Well, because God commands it. And besides the fact that God commands it, because it is beautiful. You know, what do you think is the most beautiful thing about God? If you were asked, tell me the most beautiful thing about God. Well, America's greatest theologian was asked that question, and Jonathan Edwards says the most beautiful thing about God is God's holiness. Incidentally, he said that's one way to know if you really know God, if you see the beauty of His holiness. But here's what Edwards says. He says, as the beauty of the divine nature does primarily consist in God's holiness, so does the beauty of all divine things. Herein consists the beauty of the saints, that they are saints, the holy ones. Tis the moral image of God in them, which is their beauty, and that is their holiness. Now, that's not often how we hear this call. We don't often hear, be holy equals be beautiful. We don't often hear the call to holiness is the, is the path to glory. We hardly ever hear that. My little kids have a uh, catechism song uh, set to music. And one of the questions is, uh, you're like, you're some strange parents if you play catechism songs for your kids. But uh, they, they, <laughs> my kids already know more scripture at the age of six and four than I did when I was 25. Um, but one of their songs said, and what, and what, let's see if I can remember the song. Uh, did, did God create... Adam and Eve, and what, uh, what's the word, Morgan, and what, what's that? What were Adam and Eve like when God made them? Thank you. I had the jingle, but not the words. What were Adam and Eve like? Okay, and the, and the, and the, and the word is uh, holy and happy, and so here's my kids in the next seat going, holy and happy. And I just remember my kids singing holy and happy and thinking, wow, those are two words we never put together. You know, holy and happy. Like if I, if I could just be holy, then I would be happy. Only one person has ever reflected God's character in all of His ways, and that's Jesus. Holiness means growing to look more and more like Jesus, who lived, think about the life Jesus lived, the most beautiful, the most free, the most human and the most holy life anyone has ever lived, Jesus. That's what it means if you want to be concrete. What does it mean for you to live a holy life? Look at Jesus. To see the beautiful and free life that God intends for you. 
But as with humility, you'll never want this until you are convinced that this call to holiness is not meant to be a burden. This is meant to set you free and lead you to joy. The theme of this week is glorification. This is God's path to glory, to pursue holiness. So you want glory, and God says, this is the path. But it does leave us with a conundrum, a riddle. Why would God call us to be what seems impossible for us to ever become? I mean, if this is God's calling for us to be holy, how could we ever live up to it? But the Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, God's commandments are not burdensome. You ever read that and you thought, how could that be true? When all they do is feel like a burden to me, how can holiness be beautiful and not a burden? How can holiness become not simply an ideal belonging to Jesus, but a reality belonging to us? Well, the gospel is the answer. And when I say gospel, I mean something very specific. I mean union with Christ. That may not be the way you're normally used to hearing or thinking about the gospel, but when I say the gospel, I mean to be saved is to be united to the Savior. That better than anything else God gives us, God gives us Himself. That is the good news, communion with God. We're united with God. Out of that, out of that union flows every other gift of the Christian life, forgiveness, justification, sanctification, glorification, you name it. But it all starts with union with Christ. That you are in Christ and Christ is in you. That's union with Christ. You are in Christ and Christ is in you. Well, let me show you how this helps you in your pursuit of holiness, union with Christ. Stay with me. Union with Christ is the anchor of holiness. See, it's the anchor. So many of our fears or suspicions concerning holiness concern our lack of it or our doubt that it's truly a good thing. You may know the Bible's word for holiness is sanctification. On the one hand, the Bible insists that in Christ, our sanctification, our holiness is finished and complete. For example... This is one of the most important verses of the New Testament. This was, the, this was the verse that was ricocheting around in Martin Luther's mind when the Reformation kicked off. 1 Corinthians 1.30 You were in Christ Jesus who became to us righteousness and sanctification. The Bible is saying Christ is not only your Savior, He is your sanctification. He is your holiness. Already full and complete. In Christ, 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, you were washed, you were, past tense, sanctified. You were sanctified. In this sense, holiness is not something we achieve, it is something we receive by faith in total. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says, already we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It's a very important concept. The uh, great theologian John Murray called this definitive sanctification. Definitive means, means complete. Definitive sanctification. And he adds, it is a fact too frequently overlooked that in the New Testament, the most characteristic terms that refer to sanctification are used not of a process, but of a once-for-all definitive act. So let me sum that up. On the one hand, the Bible talks about sanctification being complete for you and being finished. But Christ, because Christ has already joined His life to yours irrevocably and fully. And Hebrews says, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. See, what is the anchor of your soul? How does this anchor you? Well, think about what an anchor does. Think about what an anchor does. On the one hand, it protects us from visible threats. From, from the wind and the waves, from, from temptations and trials. This, this anchor that is our union with Christ protects us from those things that make us doubt God's care over us or His benevolence towards us. See, an, the, these waves come into our life, don't they? These waves come in various forms. They, 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 they come in outward circumstances. Things happen to us and we think, God, if you love me, why is this happening to me? That's a wave. 
or these waves come from our inward doubts and dispositions. If I really loved God, why would I keep doing this? Why would I keep falling into this pit? See, if our hope is anchored in ourselves or in our own experience, we will never be at peace. We will never be settled. Because we'll, 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 we'll constantly be bobbing up and down with the waves. When it comes to a life of holiness, the holiness of Christ already achieved for you definitively, completely, irrevocably, as irrevocable as the Word of God itself, that is your anchor. That is your anchor. And just as an anchor gives a ship confidence that it will not be toppled, so our union with Christ gives us confidence that our sanctification is definitive and complete. Or let me say it in simpler terms. It gives us confidence that our holiness does not fall with our failures. Your holiness does not fall with your failures. Your holiness does not fall with your failures. Or I'll add, rise with your successes. See, thank God it's not up to you. Which means you can't mess it up. See, this is the anchor of your holiness, your union with Christ. And this settles you. See, it says you are safe, you are secure, you are, you are anchored. But union with Christ is not only your anchor in holiness, it not only tells you you are already holy, definitively and completely, union with Christ is also the engine of our holiness. The engine. Now watch this. The gift of holiness through our union with Christ doesn't make the pursuit of holiness unnecessary. The Bible is quite open about this. Look at the passages we read. Prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Be holy as I am holy. That's a command. 2 Peter 3 verse 18 says we are to grow in grace. Ephesians 4 15 says we are to grow up in every way into Christ. So in the Bible, holiness is both what we already are and at the same time, what we must yet become. If that's confusing to you, this is how God has always interacted with His people. He set Israel apart. Remember, that's what holiness means, to be set apart. He set Israel apart as His people. He called them out of Egypt. You shall be my people. He set them apart. And then, Exodus 19.6, He called them to be holy. He didn't set them apart because they were morally superior. In fact, He reminds them just the opposite was the case. God was saying, I have set you apart, now live like it. This is what God always says to His people. I've made you holy, now be holy. We are declared holy that we might become so. Now how does this, how does this empower you in your, in your pursuit of holiness? So that you see this as a beautiful and good thing. Well, we, we said that to be saved is to be united to the Savior. And Jesus is a full and complete Savior. So He not only takes away the guilt of all of your sins, He sets you free from the power of indwelling sin. See, He, he cleanses us from both the penalty and the power of our sins. He not only declares us holy, He empowers us to be so. Because remember, union with Christ, it doesn't just mean you're in Christ, it means Christ is in you. The presence and power of Jesus now dwells within you. That's the Holy Spirit. And just as Jesus lived a completely holy life and so was able to overcome every temptation, so now, because He lives within you, you are no longer on your own. Jesus gives you, and you, and you, and you. He gives you a new disposition to live for Him. That's where what can be abstract and vague, this call to be holy, becomes concrete and personal. See, holiness comes from living in communion with Christ. I, I mentioned the film Rudy the other night. Some of you saw that movie, the, the great film Rudy about the little guy and his whole life, all he wanted to do was play on the Notre Dame football team. It's just he lived and breathed and ate Notre Dame. He loved Notre Dame, but Rudy was too small and he was too short. And, and they just laughed at him and said, you will never make it on the team. But you remember in the climactic scene of the uh, uh, film, after, after Rudy has, has knocked himself out to be a walk-on, 
after he's worked harder than anyone on the team, the coach says to him, Rudiger, that was his last name, Rudy Rudiger. Rudiger, if only I could take your heart and put it in all my players, no one would ever beat us. Now that is what God has done for you. He has taken the heart of Christ and put it in all of his players. That's why he's called the Holy Spirit. Because he is none other than the obedient presence of Christ within you. Let me just stop right there and and think about that. Because you will never hear anything more wonderful in your life. To be a Christian means that you have the incarnate, obedient, crucified, resurrected, reigning, and ascended Lord within you forever. He's with me, and I'm with him. That's what empowers you. That is your engine. Now, why do we need an anchor and an engine? Stay with my line of thought. Anchor and engine. Why do we need an anchor and an engine? That you were in Christ gives you assurance. That Christ is in you gives you power. And together, these help us move out in confidence. See, if we stopped with where we often stop, with just the bare command, be holy, ah, that would leave us where we're most often left, with our own feeble best efforts. If we base our objective standing before God on our subjective day-to-day performance, that is a recipe for spiritual depression. And that is one reason, not the only reason, that is one reason that some of you are spiritually depressed. Because you are basing your objective standing before God on your subjective day-to-day performance. As one old theologian put it, many acknowledge that we are justified by the righteousness of Christ, but seem to think, or at least they act as if, they must be sanctified by a holiness they themselves have acquired. Now he's saying that we can say Jesus makes me right with God, but so few of us live that way. Walter Marshall, the old writer, calls this the key error of the Christian life. He's saying nothing is going to bedevil your life more than this confusion. But that's how so many of us are living. And it only results from our feeling defeated in our sin, like, I'll never get there. Or cynical, does anyone get there? Or resigned. You know, why even try? Unless you have a living understanding of your union with Christ, this call to holiness we're talking about tonight, pursue holiness, will come across as oppressive or unbearable or impossible. And you'll keep falling in the same ditches over and over. Now, if I've lost you in this line of thought, the Greek poet Pindar coined the phrase that captures this reality. He said, become what you are. In calling us to be holy, God isn't asking us, in calling you to be holy, God is not asking you to make up some deficit. God does not look at you as if something is lacking in you. That's how you look at yourself, but that's not how God looks at you. You do not obey out of a deficit. (laughs) This is so important. We obey out of fullness, and that makes all the difference. Now, this dynamic is all over the Bible, but there are three places in the New Testament that capture this dynamic most concisely and beautifully. Here they are, three examples. First, 1 John 3.3. 1 John 3.3. Everyone who thus hopes in Christ purifies himself just as he is pure. Like, you are pure, seek purity. You are perfect, seek perfection. That's 1 John 3.3. 3. Here's my favorite, Philippians 3.12. Paul makes the same point in Philippians. He says, Not that I have already obtained this or achieved my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has already taken hold of me. You hear the dynamic? Christ Jesus has already taken hold of Paul to do for him what he could never do for himself, be holy. But in celebrating that he has been given this gift, Paul is clear to say, not that I have already obtained this, but I press on. And elsewhere he compares himself to a champion runner. He says, I press on toward Christ. But he doesn't press on under the cloud of needing to measure up. He does not press on under the cloud of needing to measure up. 
See, you, we obey in a fullness. Here's one more example. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints. <laughs> you see, there's the dynamic. Already sanctified and yet called to be saints. Actually, the word saint captures the mystery of holiness perfectly. Today we use that word. We use that word to uh, speak of exemplary models of holiness like Mother Teresa. But the biblical writers, when they call the, their audience saints, they are writing to people with debilitating and persistent sin. Okay, and, they, and yet they call their readers saints, even though the contents of their letters will make it clear that their lives are far from saintly. What's going on there? It is an undeserved but ennobling compliment. It's saying, saint, become what you are. So if you followed me this far, and I know you are, you could say, well, okay, is it up to God or is it up to me? False dichotomy. Becoming, faith, becoming holy is by faith alone. At the same time, the biblical writers do not shy away from talking about our effort. Jesus says, Luke 13, 24, strive to enter by the narrow gate. And Peter says flatly, this is 1 Peter 1, 5, make every effort. Make every effort. Jerry Bridges, in his wonderful little book, The Pursuit of Holiness, summarizes, no one can attain any degree of holiness without God working in his life, but just as surely will no one attain it without effort on his own part. God has made it possible for us to walk in holiness, but He has given us the responsibility of doing the walking. Now, let me see if I can draw these threads together and make some applications. Union with Christ is what makes holiness the path to glory. Union with Christ is what makes holiness both beautiful and accessible. See, Christ has made holiness a reality for you. You are in Christ. And He has made it a possibility for you. Christ is in you. Let me illustrate it this way. My, my little boy, I told you, just turned six. I just taught him uh, how to ride a bicycle with no training wheels. And, oh, Jack was terrified. We went to the local park where if he fell, he would fall in the grass. And... I was behind him, you know, had my hand on his seat, and I was behind him, I'd run behind him, and every once in a while, you know, I'd let go, but, but it was hard at first, because Jack, you know, was going around, but he was doing like this, you know, to make sure, like, Daddy, are you there? And especially if I took my hand off his back, you know, Daddy, are you there? You can't move forward if you're always anxiously checking. But when Jack was able to hear my voice, even though he could not see me, but he trusted that I was right there with him. Then he was able to move forward in confidence and joy. See, one of the reasons holiness is so scary or unattractive for us is we keep setting it as a bar we can never reach. Or we have a secret suspicion that God is disappointed in us. That He's not there for us or pleased with us. So, so, so just like my little boy, we keep anxiously checking. Dad, are you there? Are you pleased with me? But once we understand our holiness in the context of our union with Christ, it becomes beautiful. Don't you see, excuse me, don't you see God is making you beautiful? That is the image of God being restored in you. He is transforming you from one degree of glory to another. And God is committed to you over the course of the whole journey until you see Him face to face. And when we see Him, we shall be like Him. But until that day, we too can pedal with all of our might in confidence and joy. And strive after holiness, confident that we already are. See, God does not ask you to attain what you never could. He only calls you to strive for what you already are. So when you are discouraged, do not look at yourself. When you fall, keep looking at Jesus, who has already taken hold of you. 
Psalm 29, verse 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory do His name and worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. This is the path to a beautiful, glorious life. Pursuing holiness. You know, I thought to myself before this week, how in the world am I going to go talk to hundreds of college students you know, who have been out in the sea and sand all day and they're tired and they're sunburned and, and I'm going to say, pursue holiness. But you know what? That is God's will for us. That is God's best for us. So in closing tonight, let me give you some pictures of how union with Christ can help you in your daily pursuit of holiness. See, you're on a quest. You're on a journey. And as with any epic quest, there be dragons. See, you're... It's not without reason the life of faith is called a battle. So tonight I thought we'd conclude by looking at how union with Christ helps us in the daily battle. We know where we are moving toward our horizon. We know we are equipped. We know that victory is certain. And yet the battle must be fought. Put on the full armor of God. So let me give you some pictures. First, union with Christ, your union with Christ, will not let you rest in your sin. For how could the Holy One rest within you as long as you were resting in your sin? See, God will, by His grace, let you become miserable in your disobedience. He will let you become weary in running from Him. That is the grace of God, weariness. Union with Christ won't let you rest in your sin. Secondly, your union with Christ helps you in your daily battle with sin. Your daily battle. Martin Luther's old hymn put it, We're not the right man on our side, our striving would be losing. But the right man is on our side. And how does this change how we fight sin? Well, let's take an, an area of, uh, that's an area of struggle for practically every one of us, honoring God's gift of sexuality. It's no surprise that this good desire is so easily distorted when you have more access to pornography on your cell phone than an earlier generation could have imagined. But I want you to watch how the Apostle Paul draws on union with Christ to help fight sexual temptation. This is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 15. He says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? See, there's the union with Christ. He reminds them of the union with Christ. You're one with Christ, he's saying. So then, how can you unite yourself to another in a way that you know dishonors him? You see the principle? He reminds them of their glorious identity in Christ. He's like, this is who you are in Christ. And then he calls them to holiness. In effect, he's saying, that's not who you are. So that's not how you need to live any longer. That's not who you are. So that's not how you need to live any longer. As opposed to, don't do that. Stop that. Bad dog. That's not how he does it. Instead, he said, call to mind your union with Christ to stand firm. And one more picture. You know, I talked about uh, riding a bicycle. We know on our bicycle sometimes we fall. And we know sometimes in our, in our Christian lives perhaps several times each day, that we fall. Union with Christ will not let you despair when you fall. I mean, give yourself a little grace. We all fail to live up to our best intentions, even the Apostle Paul, who says, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. See, this power, this enemy within has been decisively de defeated, but his Presence remains powerful. So how can we fall without despairing? Well, one of the great classics of devotional literature, I'm not sure if it's on the back table, but one of the great classics of devotional literature is the letters, letters of Samuel Rutherford. And in one of those letters, uh, someone is despairing in their sin whether they really know Christ. And I think you know that. You've asked yourself... Jesus, why do I keep failing here? If I really knew you, if you're really in me, why do I keep failing here? And this is how Rutherford answers your query. 
You doubt whether you are in Christ or not. I answer, you owe charity to all people, but most of all to your loving and lovely Jesus, and also to your renewed self, because you are not your own, but Christ and His work and the work of His Spirit are in you, so to slander His work is to wrong Jesus. Wow. Rutherford is saying to doubt your salvation because you have fallen. You are slandering the perfect work of Christ for you. You are not laying hold of the double power of Christ that has forgiven you completely already and will heal you completely. That not only gives you the strength to face the day, to move out not in cynicism, but in power, the assurance that God is for you, that is your anchor, the knowledge that God is in you, that is your engine, and the confidence that God is not disappointed in you, but is with you, and that is your horizon. See, you are in Christ, and you are full. Now, live out of that fullness. So when you fall, you do not despair. When we slip, we do not cast down in shame. Do not slander Christ by doubting His faithfulness to you just because you aren't faithful to Him. When you know He is faithful day after day after day, that will help you today in striving to be faithful to Him. So what should you be doing? He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. It is the whole reason Christ saved you. It is the purpose of your redemption. And you can place that as a bar over every day, not as a bar to live up to, but as an ennobling compliment to live into. Saint, become what you are. I just got to tell you one story and then we're done. It was told by an old man. He used to teach uh, over 100 years ago in Arkansas in a one-room schoolhouse. And he tells the story of a, of a young boy named Arlie, very poor, and another little boy named Tommy, very wealthy. Tommy's dad owned the general store, and Arlie lived in a cabin back in the woods, no electricity. And they would both come to school, and at Christmas time, Tommy would be able, because of his dad at the general store, to bring gifts that no one in the school had ever seen, let alone Arlie. And he came in one Christmas with oranges. Now we're all too young to know this, but maybe if your grandparents are still alive, they can tell you fruit used to be one of your best gifts at Christmas. That's why some of you still get fruit in your stocking. That's a, that's a, that's a relic of the past. Fruit used to be one of the best gifts at Christmas. And one day Tommy came in with oranges. And he would sit there and the teacher would watch and, and, and Tommy was just peeling this orange and, and Arlie had never seen an orange. And he was just, his eyes were just watering. And Tommy, a mischievous boy, Tommy, he looked over at Arlie and he said, do you want some? And Arlie said, oh, I would, I would love some. And Tommy handed him the peel. And Arlie put the peel in his mouth and he bit down and he savored every bitter, soured crunch. And the teacher thought, my stars, he's given him the peel. So the teacher got in his Model T and he drove out in the woods the next day as far as he could and parked his car. And he went to the general store beforehand and he bought toys and clothes and oranges. And he found Arlie's cabin and he knocked on the door. Well, Arlie was blown away that his teacher would come to see him. And the teacher says, Arlie, I have something for you. And he went to the table and he dumped out on the table the toys and the clothes the oranges. What do you think Arlie went for? And he started to peel that orange and he, started, and, he, and he got the peel off and he started to put the peel in his mouth and the teacher put his hand out and he says, no, Arlie. And then the teacher took, his, took that orange and he put his thumbs in. It's one of these big oranges. And he broke it open and went, you know, and the ju juice was, went everywhere and he said, everyone in the, oh, everyone in the room went, oh, and then he took, he took one of those wedges and he handed the wedge to the little boy. And this is what he writes. 
I will never forget looking into Arlie's eyes when he bit down. And the juice and the flavor of that orange exploded on his tongue. It was the look of a boy who never in his wildest dreams could imagine God could make something that would taste so good. Friends, when it comes to the glorious life Jesus promises you, have you just been eating peels? Well, I think most of us have. We've never bitten down on the gospel. We're settling for far less than our glorious destiny. But you know what? Your destiny, this heaven to come, when you pull off the tree, a fruit of the tree, in that glorious day, and you put it in your mouth on that glorious day, it will make the sweetest, juiciest orange you have ever tasted in this world seem like cardboard. This is your glorious destiny. Until then, you can pursue the path to glory. How do you do that? Pursue holiness. That is biting down. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, let me pray for us. Well, Lord, I pray for us. I pray for these students. Pray for myself that we would become people, that we would become disciples of Jesus for whom holiness is a good and beautiful word. That when we hear that word, it is not something we fear, it is something we strive for and toward. Knowing that we are completely holy already in Christ. So now we can pursue it. We can make every effort to bite down on the fullness of the gospel. Christ, help us. Amen.